Okay, welcome back everybody. Apologies for the last two video edits. On the first one I ran out of batteries for about, with about two minutes to go. In this last one I ran out of SD card. So hopefully we don't do that too many more times. The next one I do is when I don't push in my microphone all the way and I have it half in there and it's inaudible and you only get the video. So that's the next error that I'll make. So these are all user errors, so at least the technology is working fine. Um, welcome back. I just want to remind us that we do have a homework that's due in the coming weeks. So we'll have a review session before this is due. That'll be next Thursday. So not this Thursday, but next Thursday. And the um, next day is when the, the homework is due. If my calendar is right in my mind. So that's the schedule. A lot of these problems, like 5152, are basic probability questions. Questions about independence, things like that. Uh, there's a couple problems at the end that have you work through some integrals. And there's probably some things I want to say about those problems, and that's why we're doing them. My expectation is we'll ask some questions about those in review sessions. So if you're having trouble working through the integral, understanding what the integrals say, what am I supposed to do, Probably what will happen is you might ask a couple questions on Slack, and then we'll spend an hour talking about it in the review session. So I'm happy to spend as much time on the problems as we can. So again, this is about learning. It's not just about challenging you. So um, there's plenty of things I want to say. So there's a problem on here that has you derive a t-distribution from a mixture of normals and chi-squareds. But chi-squareds, I think of as gamma distributions. So. And I think about that problem in a totally different context when I do that integral. Um, but the way they set it up is perfectly correct as well. Um, it's a similar line of attack for inducing a t-distribution. So let me just ask you a question. What's a t-distribution? Where do they come up? There's no way you haven't heard of it before. Who derived the t-distribution? Gossip. Gossip, very good. So, and his pseudonym is? Student. So why did he pick student? Good history, huh? He worked at a brewery and publish his online. Yeah, that's right. So he worked over at which brewery? Guinness. Who knows? So Guinness. And he was trying to understand, well, basically quality control. So he was hired on, he was a chemist. So doing a bunch of stuff, trying to understand the match. I've never made beer before, but apparently like you mash up some corn or some grains or something like that. And the way you do that and the ingredients you put into it has to do with the quality of the, the drink that you get out. So he was basically trying to test whether or not each batch that they would create are the same. So he's basically doing group testing and seeing if the, the, the ingredients in the, I guess, the secret formula um, we're going to be the same on each run. So, and we've probably seen that before where we're doing two sample testing to see if those two samples are the same. So, somebody tell me real quickly what's a t test test? Equality of means. Yeah, the equality of means. So, it's not testing the equality of the distribution, it's a proxy for the distribution. Are the means the same? And a t distribution is usually in induced when you don't know something. What don't you know? Oh, the variance. The variance. So it's usually what you, you did in STAT 101 if you're doing testing two groups and you didn't know what the variance was. Um, I will point out that if the two variances are both unknowns and they're different, it is not a t-distribution. I don't care what they told you in STAT 101 class, they lied to you. We will try to clarify that lie later on. It's approximately t. And that's where that saddle weight correction stuff comes from. It's actually got what's called a Barron's Fisher distribution. So and the reason they don't want to talk about that way back when is they worked with tables, and you would have to table a four-parameter distribution. And so that's not a very nice thing to do. So the tables would be a book for just one distribution. And so they have these simplifications. Nowadays, we have computers, and we don't have to do all that stuff. So the people still do it. So the, the past is still kind of buried into the future here. We have to figure out what's good and what we want to get rid of. I do, I do um, feel terrible about that Barron's Fisher thing. 
feeling terrible that my, my undergrad teachers told me non-truths, I should say it that way. Um, and I feel terrible for you too, but we'll see if we can clarify that. I have an extra credit assignment on Barron's Fisher down here. So there's a couple extra credit assignments that I can come up with. I have an MCMC one, that might be this one, and I have another one on the Barron's Fisher problem that sometimes I introduce to you guys. Okay, uh, if you haven't heard what the Barron's Fisher problem is, I've said that word quite a few times. Look it up, it's one of the famous problems in statistics. So. Um, it does appear in the book. There's a problem on, in the book on it, but basically it's that our two means equal to each other when you don't know the variances, and the variances are wildly different from each other. Or I should just say different from each other. And the approximation becomes really bad when they're very different from each other. Okay, there's some problems I want you to answer. I think that these ones probably you can do pretty easily, so get started on that. We'll kind of see where you're at in the class. So this is meant to be review, and then these problems right here are meant to be a little bit harder, and stuff that we can talk about um, in the review sessions. I do have another problem here that I say, also prove sampling without replacement, and I think you understand what that means. That I reach into a bucket and I grab something and I write down what it is, and I don't replace it into the bucket. And then I sample again. So I'm changing the population every single time. It's not IID. Or I can say it a different way, it's not simple random samples. Simple random samples are IID samples. So the part that's not IID is it's not identically distributed every single time. When you change the population that you're sampling from, um, on every step, it's not identical on the next step. So sampling without replacement changes the probabilities of grabbing things. So I think we know what that is. We would have learned that in any sort of basic stack inference class or even a probability class, but we might not have learned this concept of exchangeability. So I invoke a new word right here. If you didn't know what it is, how would you find out what this word means? Cool. You look it up. Yeah, exactly. What does it mean, exchangeability in statistics? So let's just consider two um, random samples. I'm just going to think about x1 and x2. Both of these things, I'll write it like this, come from some distribution f of x given the beta. So if you want to see this in a slightly different way, I could say xi comes from f of x. Some distribution is defined on random variable x conditional on beta. So my bar always means to the right hand side you've conditioned on that. Sometimes people change the meaning of the bar, so we'll have to be a little bit careful, and I'll talk about that, but we have to understand what they're implying when they change the meaning of the bar. So notation, just like anything, tends to be inconsistent. So, but what we mean should be entirely consistent. Um, so this is the random variable, and these are the parameters. So this is a function of this, and this is conditioned on. Or you might say this is random and that is fixed. So lots of ways to say the same thing. So what I'm thinking in my mind is I have some parameters that determine the shape of this distribution, and this is a function of x, so these are the realizations. So if I keep sampling from this, I'm gonna get these realizations over in here, and if I made a histogram of this, if I had enough realizations, I would eventually be able to refine the shape of that distribution. So that's sampling. So just a little bit of notation here. So, and I would say this is i goes from 1 to 2. So it's going to be one of those two things. So same exact thing. So I've got a sampling distribution. I haven't written in the parameters, but if you're thinking about maybe a normal distribution or something like that, so for example, example maybe this is a normal x with parameters mu and sigma squared. I might think of those as the parameters theta. So those are the underlying parameters. If you tell me something is normally distributed, you're telling me something about the exponential decay of the tails. 
exponentially decays in a quadratic sense, the, quad, the tails of this distribution, and it's centered at this parameter mu, and it has a spread that has something to do with this parameter sigma. So sigma is actually the distance from mean to the inflection point right there. So it's an optimization problem. I don't know if that's ever helped me to do any statistics, but I like thinking about that sometimes. So I'll just kind of draw it in that way. So it underlines the shape of this distribution. If you know this belongs in the normal family. So normal distributions are a collection of distributions. And once you tell me mu and sigma, you've defined the membership of that. So back to exchangeability. We'll just forget about that normal distribution. We're thinking about sampling without replacement, so we're actually going to be changing the distribution on each step. So you can think of a problem like maybe these are for newly coin flips, and maybe this is like red and blue or something like that, two colors. So binary outcomes. And I have some number of red things in a bucket and some number of blue things in a bucket. And I'm going to reach in there, I'm going to grab maybe a red thing, hold it out, and I'm going to decrement how many red things are in the bucket by one, and I'm going to decrement n by one, so the population size. So exchangeability means this. This is at least with two samples. It means that I can interchange the order of those two things. So it's a really main, uh, well-named thing. It doesn't matter what the order is in which I got the two things. It only matters that I got them. So let me give you an example. Let's imagine that I have um, n is equal to 5. And I'm going to say I'm going to have red things. There's going to be three of them. In blue things, there's going to be two of them. Let's get rid of this for a second. These add up to five. So I have a bucket of five things. Three of the balls are red, two of the balls are blue. I'm going to sample maybe a red, and then I'm going to sample a blue. Okay, so let's say this is my sample. So that's my sample right there, my, you know, very clumsily concocted example that I think we can all understand pretty quickly. So I have this right here. So what's the probability of getting red on the first draw? Three out of one. What's the probability of getting a blue on the second draw? Two out of four. So you did the subtraction in your head. Very good. So let's just re reverse this. And let's say we are looking at x1 and x2 is equal to blue and red. Try to be consistent. So what is the probability of this? So I would end up writing down this might be probability of x1 and x2 is equal to that number for our first outcome. Now if I do this again, what's the probability of getting blue? Two out of five. And then what's the probability of getting red on the next draw? Three out of four. And you do a little bit of rearrangement right here. It has to do with the exchangeability, the commutativity of these numbers. So I'll let you think very hard about this kindergarten sort of example. There's probably lots that can be said about it. But the point is, is that these numbers are equal to each other. So exchangeability just says, either in a continuous sense, this is true in my discrete sense where I use the probability function. This is, um, these are the same. So I can write down probability of x1 is equal to a red and x2 is equal to a blue is the same as the probability of x1 is equal to a blue, x2 is equal to a red. So I can kind of exchange those two things and the probability is the same. If you want to carve out a full-blown proof on this, you would have to induct over the number of things, the number of groups that we have, and the number of colors. I don't require that you do that. 
If you want to do it just with two different colors, that's fine with me. So the point is, is the data is exchangeable, but it's not conditionally independent because I'm changing the distribution on each step. So the probabilities are changing on each step. So the probability model is changing on each step. So the data is independent, is exchangeable, but it's not um, independent of each other. So I just want to point that out. Independence is not a characteristic of your data. Independence is a characteristic of your data with the known model in hand. So it's a concept about the model with the data, where exchangeability is just a concept about the data itself. I want to point out this is not true. So f of x1, I'll write it down with the PR, but I'll be totally inconsistent about this. x1 given x2 is not equal to the probability of x1 because I've changed the model in each step. I learn from the data every time I see it. If I don't know the parameterization of everything, what the probabilities are in the first place, if I didn't know all this stuff and what the probabilities are, I learned through the data. So another way of writing this we'll say is probability of x1 I'll write it down jointly. X2 is not equal to probability of X1 times the probability of X2. That's not true here because we're learning about things by observing the data. This is true. Probability of X1 and X2 given theta, the model parameters, the probabilities that are induced by these things, knowing P in my head and tails example. So if I know what the parameters are, then I can factorize it. And this is where I concluded last time. I was basically trying to make this point. If you know the parameters of the model, then you can factorize everything. Hopefully, you can derive something like this. Probability of x1 given x2 and theta is going to be equal to probability of x1 given theta. These are the same statements. You can just divide this out. Over here, write down the conditional model for everything, and then you notice that it's just equal to this. So if I divide both sides by x2 given theta, I wind up with a conditional distribution. So if you condition on theta somewhere in the model, you need to condition on it everywhere in all of your calculations. So the point is, is that if I know the model parameter seeing data, if I know the whole probability model, if I see this data, it doesn't help me to tell what's going on, um, maybe in the future. I guess the way I wrote it down was in the past. So if you like this a little bit better, this is the exact same thing. I can just divide the other side by everything. So divide by this one. Basic elementary statistics. So what is the conditional probability? It's the probability of the joint divided by the margin. So that's what it is every single time. Let me just re-emphasize this point. This doesn't make me a Bayesian because I think this way. It just tells me about what I actually know about the data. The point being is that exchangeability is a data concept and independence is a model-based concept. So if you're trying to come up with concepts that are inherent about the data and you just want to talk about the data, um, you can't talk about independence per se because you need the whole model in hand and you need to know what the parameters are. If that's not a deep, profound thing to you, you're not thinking hard enough about something very simple. So 
Um, anyway, it gives us the ability to forecast because we learned the parameters. Let me just go back to my MATLAB example that we looked at last time. We have this thing where I'm flipping coins. I've got some probability up here, 0.95. You might be thinking, well, there's going to be a plethora of heads. 95% of them are heads. So you can't learn anything about this data because you already know 95% of them are going to be heads. They're exchangeable. So if it's IID, it's exchangeable, but not the other way around. That's what you're proving. So if I change this number and you don't get to see it, so let me just do that. You don't know what it is. I hit save. I erased it from you. Now you can learn about future outcomes because you're going to be estimating basically what P is in your mind as you see this list scroll through. So I flip the coins again, and what do you think I did to P? I made it much smaller. So the data itself is not independent because you're learning about it, but in the presence of P, then it is all independent. That's the point I'd like to make. So. <laughs> Stats is different than probability class for this reason because you need to infer what the model is along the way. What I'm going to be teaching you in this class is how to infer the model parameters given that you know what the model is. And that's a bit of a fiction because a lot of times you don't know what the model is. So modelers, they try certain things. They start out with simple models. They look at residuals and then they refine. So I won't be teaching you how to do that whole iterative process. That's what you'll be learning through all of your projects. Chris? So like in the example you just gave with the five balls, three red people, we, we know all the parameters of the probability. But if you didn't, you know because I wrote them down on the board. Right. But if I took those away from you and I didn't tell you what they were, then you'd be learning through the data. Right, I was wondering about that statement though, x2 given x1 is equal to probability of x2. So like, yeah, yeah, so like in X, in X1 being red, doesn't that change the probability of X2 or blue? Or... Yeah, but I know what the model parameters are, so they're actually changing in that example. The thetas are changing and I get to know what they are. Okay. The point that I'm making is that independence doesn't apply to data itself. It applies to data with models. So, and that's a fiction. You know, it's something we do in the classroom where we have to build those models up somehow. So it works really well in this class with a book and it says the data came from this model. Now tell us what, what you know about the model parameters given all the data. That's what inference is. I just want to point out data is not independent of each other. Data given model, then you have independence. Data might be exchangeable though. So if it's independent, the data is exchangeable. So that's true. And how do you know that? Because when I am able to factorize everything, I'm able to permute everything around in any order, and you come up with the exact same thing. I can marginalize out theta, and that's how you get to the marginal distributions. If I want to get rid of theta in the equation, there's only one thing I can do. I have to upgrade it to a random variable and integrate it out. How do you upgrade something to a random variable? You multiply by its margin. What do I think that means? I think it means Bayes' theorem, but you can call it anything you want. There's some deep concepts. If that you're not into that, um, well, probably better because philosophy is just kind of frustrating altogether. I want to point out a few things about the book. Chapter five is basically just preliminaries on probability. We're still in probability, but we're going to be using that stuff to do inference. So I want to just get us some practice before we jump into chapter six. Chapter six is about philosophy. So my experience has been there's two types of students. So there's a small proportion of students that like the philosophy stuff. I was that student. I really dwelled on it. That's what made me a faculty member. So there's another bunch of students that are like, how do I use it? Tell me what I do with it. And that's what chapter seven is about. And so we're going to be sprinkling lots of chapter seven stuff throughout the other chapters before we get to chapter seven. But chapter seven is where I want to spend most of the time. Chapter eight in the book is about hypothesis testing. We will go through it. 
it's my least favorite topic in all of statistics, but I'll at least tell you what Nathan Pearson is all about, and I'll give you some unsatisfying answers and tell you where the debates live. So, uh, if you want to know more how Bayesian approaches all those problems, I'll give you like a two-day lecture on that, um, and then I'll tell you more in my Bayes class if you have the endurance to take that. It's actually an easier class than this one. David? Okay, so about what you wrote more on that um, top bit about the probabilities. Um, if you're saying we don't know the uh, parameter, how can you write that probability? Um, how do you even write it down? Yeah. You have to assume a distribution on the parameter. So what do you do to do it? If I want to get rid of, if I want to come up with f of x, and all I've got is theta, there's only one big and down, you need to mar multiply by a marginal probability and integrate over the theta. And is the top line still true? The top line still true. Are you sure? It's not true. So this thing, these, this right here, this right here is not true unless I know that's not true, this isn't true. These are basically the same lines. You feel better if I write that? Yeah. Yeah, that's what I meant. So these are not equal to each other. Not equal unless we know theta. They're exactly the same statements right there. The factorization and then the learning sort of idea. Again, all I'm saying is the data tells you something about the future. If data was independent of each other, it would tell you you can't use data to forecast. You don't learn. So obviously you're learning something. What are you learning? You're learning the probabilities, at least in our example with red and blue balls. So you're learning the model parameters. It's a point that I find important, and I'll keep stressing it, and I'll say conditionally independent. So we can use that form to factorize these things out with theta, and we use that model representation, and then we try to learn the theta through it. That's what inference class is all about. It's different than what they'll teach you in a secondary class. They'll just say, oh, factorization. Then somebody will say, well, what about theta? And they'll call you a Bayesian. That's at least my experience. And I'm still confused because I know you need theta in there to factorize because you learn. So, and we just saw that kind of through this example. Let's just look at this one more time. Still in the motivation phase, warming up, understanding concepts, untangling concepts. We have a plethora of tails in here. There was an egghead in there, so I know that the probability at least has to be something greater than zero. I learned that by looking at that. I didn't learn much. I learned that P was probably pretty small, and P is pretty small in the example. So again, as I'm collecting all those data, I might use the empirical frequency to say what I think P is along the way. I'd actually do something slightly different, but if you want to think about using the empirical frequency to estimate P, that's probably okay as long as P isn't too small or too big. We'll talk more about that once we get into estimation techniques. Okay, so that's just where we were last time. Let's come back to another problem. Let's come back to our original problem that I wrote on the board on the first day. I want to just use this as a motivator I'm not going to tell you everything you need to know about this problem, but I'm going to be dropping Easter eggs in stuff that we're going to be using in the future. Also, I'm going to be saying stuff about the tests in the future as well. So maybe you want to remember this. So ask me questions about it if you don't understand all the subtleties I'm getting at. So here's an example. So XIs are coming from a uniform. zero theta. So everything is IID. If I don't say IID, I mean it's IID. If I'm telling you things are dependents, I need to express what the dependent structure is. So I'm not going to be too much of a stickler and write IID every single time. You can assume everything's IID unless I tell you otherwise. And then I'll have to tell you what the conditional structure is, how things are dependent. So all that means is that 
I have this model, f of x. I like to write given theta. So I write it down that I, I've got to know what theta is to define this distribution. So that's just a pet peeve. If you don't like it and you want to not write theta and satisfy everybody else and confuse everybody, all the, the complement of them, um, you can still do that. That's a common practice. So this is a distribution over x, it's a continu continuous distribution, and it's bounded by theta. So when I'm sampling n times, i goes from 1 to n, I'm just collecting samples uniformly in this interval. And if I get those samples, they're not going to be spaced out evenly like a grid. If you've ever looked at uniform samples in high dimensional space, natural clustering does happen. Where it's going to happen, you don't know. It just happens by chance. So anytime I sample uniform stuff in high dimensions, I see little pockets form by chance. So it's still uniform. So uniformity in high dimensional spaces with low sample size is very hard to tell what's going on. So we see something like that and we want to estimate theta. So we need some estimators. That's what this class is all about. In probability class, you study all the properties of this distribution. So for instance, you might write down something like this. I can't help myself and I write conditional on theta. It's what I always do. It's actually just something that I take with me from school, where it's like, I want to know that's a function of theta. And it's a reminder to me that expectations are always conditional on the thing to the right hand side of the bar. If you want to be like everybody else, you can either get rid of that or write the theta down here. So, Sometimes people write x over theta, x given theta down here. So it'll let you know everything. So the notations, there's a lot of them. And so you just have to understand they all mean the same thing. So what's the answer right here? Uniform theta. Theta. How do we solve that? We integrate x times f of x given theta dx, and we integrate over the range of where that we're in the variable length. So that's all you do. What's this sampling distribution? I say disk, but I mean density because it's a continuum. The distribution is technically the measure that lives between 0 and 1, so the things you'll integrate. I'll say it the wrong way pretty regularly. I say yes, I really mean density. And that's pretty normal. So if you'll hear everybody just conflate those two things, but there's a one-to-one -one relationship. So you can solve that integral. It's not too hard. What is the sampling distribution? What does it look like? One over there. Is that the whole distribution right there that characterizes the distribution? Tells you everything you need to know? Zero. Yeah, exactly. You need to be a little bit more kind about all of this. I probably need to say x lives between zero and theta. It has this probability and it's zero everywhere else. So I won't always write that. But I always think, used to think that, you know, that. Just tell me where it's non-zero, and we can imply where it's zero. All the stuff you didn't tell me, and I'll also come to that as well. So, but I need to be careful about this bound. All of the xi's live in there, and it doesn't exactly say that. We can imply it, but you got to be careful. Real quickly. So that's the sampling distribution, but it also has this built in there. What's the variance? Does anybody know? Off the top of their head. Sigma squared over 12. Very good. Yeah, sigma squared over 12. We always remember the 12 in there, but sometimes we forget to square the, the numerator because usually you start with uniform 0, 1, and the 1 getting squared, we forget about. All stuff that's worth knowing. There's some stochasticity to the data, so there's going to be some stochasticity to the estimators. We have a couple different estimators that we studied. So one estimator, I'll call this theta hat. 
So I'm going to not label these, but this is some version of an estimator. Dylan said last time or two times ago, maybe the maximum. So that's the max. So that's that point. Exit. So it's the closest thing over there. Maybe Dylan has good reasons for picking the max. So why pick anything else? He reminded us we did use all of the data to get the max. It's just not one data point. We needed to use all the rest of the data to order everything. So there was another estimator where we looked at the very middle of the distribution. So we tried to estimate the middle with the mean, but we're only estimating half of everything. So we want to double it to carry it over to estimate theta. So we might have said theta hat, another estimator is two times x bar. Formally what we've done, maybe, maybe this is what we are thinking about when we came up with this estimator, is we use the fact that expectation of x is equal to theta over 2. So that right there is the theoretical mean or first moment. We'll be doing a recap on what moment generating functions are, but I think you know what they are. So theoretical first moment, and what we end up doing is we attach this to the empirical first moment. So the empirical first moment is x bar. That's just sum of the xi's divided by n. And then we say they're pretty close to each other. They should be close to each other. And so we make this little sidestep right there, where we're not saying they're equal to each other, we're saying that they're close to each other. So I'm going to call that theta half. As soon as we end up, this will converge to theta. We know that maybe from the law of large numbers or the central limit theorem. It tells us how it converges. But then what we end up doing is we equate these two things and we say this x bar is equal to theta over 2. This is not actually equal, so they're not equal. But we just wrote down equal. Theta is the true parameter, so what we do is we give it a new name. And we say that's not equal, but our estimator right there is equal. So now I'm going to define this through the empirical moments and the, the theoretical moments. And then we want to have theta hat is equal to 2 x bar. So this is called method of moments when you do that. And I'll give you a lecture on this when we get into chapter 7, but I think we understand the concept. So I can imagine somebody in elementary school coming up with this analysis and going, it kind of makes sense. So they might not think to use the maximum. Question is, is this a good technique? It's okay. So there's lots of pitfalls with it. Sometimes it can work out and give you something optimal, but there are no guarantees. Let me just ask you, why did you pick the max? It's the MLE. It's the MLE. So maximum likelihood estimator. So just use the MLE, got it, boom. What do we know about MLEs? Cool, yeah, consistent is another word for cool. So they're consistent estimators under regularity conditions. We'll talk about what those are. Um, any other estimators? and match the second moment and come up with an even worse method of moments estimator. A very good idea. So, so maybe I work out something like this. I haven't coded this one up yet. So I look at x squared 
So, and I end up working through what this thing is. Do we know what this is? Not exactly. So expectation of x squared right here minus expectation of x all squared is equal to the variance of x. Sorry, I've done the same thing and I've gotten rid of all my conditional on thetas, but I'm thinking about it. So that's always true. And this thing is theta squared over 12. Dylan told us that he did the integral in his head. So probably remembers what the answer is. And so then you might end up take this thing right here. We know what this is. This is going to be theta over 2 squared. So I might take the expectation of x squared is equal to theta squared over 12 minus theta over 2 squared. And I'm going to say this is very similar to sum of the xi squared over n. So that's the empirical second moment. I don't know if this is what Dylan said or if he's going to match variance or if he's going to match the second moment. So there's lots of ways you can do it. There's a non-uniqueness to the number of ways you can come up with method of moments, estimators. So I could end up solving for theta as a function of this. So I have to go back to that quadratic formula that we learned in high school. Does anybody remember what it says? Plus. Yeah. Yeah. Minus four AC, all that stuff. Oh, there's yeah. a sign. Yeah. There's a sign there. You have to do that. Throw away one of the roots. So come up with it. It would give you a terrible estimator for all kinds of reasons. This is, I mean, okay, not terrible. It might be some form of unbiased, it would be unbiased in the variance. So if you did all of this, but it's not a property that you really want. So we'll be getting into that in chapter seven. So cool. So this is another estimator. So solving that. Any other ones? What about um, using the max, but then adding a modifier to that? So like adding a modifier. So, so taking adding the expected value of the difference between the max and the uh, and beta. Xn plus some wiggle. Yeah. And you have some, philo some philosophy for how to wiggle the max. Right. So what we might know is that the maximum is a sufficient statistic. In chapter 6 we'll learn this. We can see it in a second. I'll tell you how to recognize it quickly, at least the quick way to recognize it, and then I'll tell you the formal way to do it when we get into chapter 6. What the sufficiency principle doesn't tell you is it tells you you should use the data through the sufficient statistic, but it doesn't tell you how to use it. And so, um, Sam, is that right? Sam um, says use it in some way, and I'll try to come up with some half-baked methodology, and then we'll see if it makes any sense. We'll see how well it does, maybe. Maybe we could code that up and do a comparison. David? There's a... Um Slight issue though, because the expectation of the um, difference between the max and the parameter depends on the parameter. Depends on the parameter. So how do you come up with the wiggle? So you need to, I think what I've seen is multiplying instead of adding. I think so so you multiply by is typically n plus one of the parameter. Yeah, so xn maybe times some wiggle. And David's saying, because we know that xn is bounded by theta on the right. This wiggle that he's multiplying by um, should be greater than 1. And probably Sam is saying that should be positive and have some constraint in there. Budge it over. Here's, a way, here's some different ways you can think about it. Just some, we're just pie in the sky right now, throwing down some ideas. Maybe I take xn and I subtract off the minimum. So that's the min. This seems kind of ridiculous. So we already know that this is going to be something positive. This is an estimator of zero. 
So it's estimating zero, and I'm going to subtract off some positive thing right here. So it's actually going to yank me a little bit farther away from theta. So, but asymptotically, if I just let n go off to infinity, this will converge into zero, and this will be converging into theta. So it's a consistent estimator. So we can conceptualize that. Maybe this is better. Plus x1. So this is the range times 2. Or 2 times the mid-range. So the mid-range is the arithmetic average of the min and the max, which is a weird statistic, but the book likes to use it. Uh, I would suggest that you bring up Josiah's estimator. Yeah, maybe. So I'm going to call it student. So there's also a student last year that came up with an estimator. And he said, let's look at the likelihood function in the oh, wow, pitter pat. You know, so one thing I'm going to teach you in this class is likelihood functions you need to use. So I don't care exactly how you use them or how you phrase it, but if you're not using likelihood functions, you're about to get beaten. So likelihood functions are conditional on the data you've seen in their functions over the parameter space. So let's just write it down what the likelihood function is. This is what Josiah or some student in the past came up with. I really like what he came up with and I still have it coded up in my example. So how many are we down to? Seven? We are going to down to seven estimators. Here's another one. I'm going to take the likelihood function. I'm going to write this down as all of my data, x1 to xn, however many data points that I get. And what you end up doing is you end up just writing down the sampling model and producting over it. So everything is IID, so this is the joint distribution. I want to just write down, this looks like the joint distribution for f of x given theta, but I'm going to plug in actual data into this function, and I'm going to consider this a function of the parameter space itself. And so, and the way I end up notating that to myself is I write the theta on the left-hand side of the bar. This is an extremely consistent. About half of us do this, and half of people like to flip it around the other way. Likelihood look exactly like the joint sampling distribution on the chalkboard, but they're entirely different. They're functions over the parameter space where you plug the data in. Or the sampling distribution with a function over x where I'm conditioning on the theta. So it's the flip, it's the inverse concept of that. So how do I write this thing down? I know what the sampling distribution is, it's one over theta, but I need to be more polite about all of this. And I need to write down an indicator function. So this is just gonna indicate where this thing is one over zero. And I'm gonna say the xi's themselves live in these bounds right here. So this is the sampling distribution, if I think about it as a function of x. Or it's a part of my likelihood function where I think about it as a function over theta. So let's just simplify this. We're taking the product over everything. We're saying this is 1 over theta to the n. That's not the likelihood because it doesn't have the data plugged into it. So if you want a good indicator of when you have a likelihood function written down incorrectly, it's because you have not attached the data to the parameters. So this just has to do with something to do with the parameter part, but we haven't dealt with this. So what this says right here, if I have this indicator that the xi's are all less than theta, I have the product of all those indicators. And I can write it down even simpler. So I'm just going to take a quick shortcut, and I'll let you think about this. This is exactly the same as if xn, the maximum, is less than theta. Lives between 0 and theta. If the max is bounded by theta, everything else is bounded by theta too, by definition of the maximum. So I can simplify everything. I'll tell you more about this later on. But the maximum is the thing that pops up in the likelihood function. And that's maybe what makes Dylan think, do something with the maximum, or the rest of you that came up with estimators that had something to do with the maximum. So this is the likelihood function right here. And I just want to draw it.
I think we'll come back next time and we'll do a simulation study on all these different estimators and see how they compare to each other. But this thing looks like this. I have to think about it as a function of theta right here, so theta is bigger than the max. That's what that says. Right here, that's kind of cool. Theta is bigger than the maximum. So I've got my maximum right here. I know that it's bigger at zero everywhere else. That's what this indicator is telling me. And I can see how this thing is behaving through this function. It's getting smaller and smaller and smaller as theta gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and we know that theta is positive. So that's a constraint on the problem. So this is what one over theta looks like, but we're gonna bound it by the maximum. That's supposed to be xn in braces. So this is the likelihood function right here. One over theta, and and I'll just be polite, and I'll do that. So this is zero, like like that, and this is the likelihood function. So Josiah, a previous student, said use the likelihood function, and here's what he said to do. Figure out the tipping point where there's 50% over here, and there's 50% of the mass over here. I didn't draw this very well. That looks like way more than 50%. It's probably over here. And he said, let that be the estimator, the thing in the middle of the likelihood function. Now, there's a number of reasons why I know he's beatable. So, now I would have to ask another question to know how beatable he is. How do you want to evaluate yourself? How well you do? So we need a scoring function. So I might look at something like MSE and look at how close we are on average in the squared error sense. And so if we did that, and I use that as my metric for evaluation, I would know he's beatable in even more ways. So we're going to come back and talk about this just very briefly. I don't need you to know exactly what estimator this is. I did solve for it, so I wrote down the likelihood function. I integrated until it yielded 50% of the stuff. And so I did an integral, I set it equal to one half, and then I solved for what theta was in that analysis. It took me a page of math to do. I went home after Josiah drew this picture, and I said, I wonder what that is. I bet we can close the that thing, and we can. And it looks like it's one of these estimators right here. And it turns out it's beatable, but it's pretty good. So let's come back and start to understand the reasons why some estimators are beatable and what the criterions are for evaluating estimators. So we'll do a quick simulation study, and then we'll jump into, I think, the bootstrap after that. That's it for now, you guys. Thank you very much. So again, still in motivation phase, we'll be carving through the book very soon. Did I go in to ask me about that? Uh, the the and then the side of the Do you have any insights on why that estimator might not be great? How do you interpret it? I just believe that I It's a base estimator using a flat prior. So I think you're using a flat prior and doing base, and you're looking at the posterior. Um, it's the base estimator that minimizes the absolute norm. Because you're looking at the median. The median optimizes the absolute norm. All things will learn in chapter 7. So if I'm using the absolute norm for my evaluation, there's good reason to pick the median. If I'm using MSE, it's a bad number to pick. And the flat prior doesn't make any sense for a scale prior. So I go, oh, it's a good idea. It just needs a few little things to fix it up. Okay. 